class, I'm really going to focus on what we call Main Street businesses. Main Street businesses are smaller businesses, perhaps under $5 million in revenue, where the owner is in the store and it's an owner-operated business. And that's typically what we see here in Maine. So I'm going to shy away from discussing, uh, you know, $50 million deals and mergers and acquisitions um, or a lot more technical um, transactions. And again, I want to um, draw your attention to the Q&A box. If you want to introduce yourself through that process, or if you want to type in whether you're here uh, more as a thinking of someone buying a business or you're thinking of selling a business, you could just put buyer and seller. And that gives me a sense of the balance of the, of the workshop and who's participating and I can adjust the material uh, accordingly. So feel free to do that. And I think that's it. So let's get started. So my name is Brian Hansen, and I'm a SCORE mentor. I'm having a problem with the... Elsie, you on? Yep, yep, you're having a problem with share screen or? No, I'm just trying to move through the presentation. Okay, is it not advancing to the next? It is not advancing to the next. Can you escape from the full screen? Or exit from the, yep, yeah, and. Okay, thank you. That's why we have your technical support. So my <laughs> name is Brian Hansen, I'm the president of Maine Business Brokers. We're a Portland and New Hampshire based uh, business brokerage firm. Uh, I've personally owned and bought and sold a, a fair number of businesses. So I'm not just speaking from a, um, an abstract perception. I've done this uh, quite a bit. I'm also a SCORE mentor and volunteer. And typically I teach this workshop in a, in a live presentation. So hopefully someday in the near future, we can get back to that. Uh, so as a webinar, I don't see anybody's faces. I'm looking or trying to look directly at the camera, um, but I can't get any real feedback or visual cues or, or see if anybody has any questions. Um, so for me, it's a bit of a dry presentation. So again, if you have questions or thoughts, just put it into the Q&A. Um, and I'm going to try my best to look directly into the camera at all times and uh, keep things going. And we do, Brian, we do have um, one Q&A. And do you see the notification on your window? Okay, so we have one intro in. Um, someone's not currently looking to buy or sell, but owns a business. Um, so that said, yeah, people, feel, uh, participants, feel free to use Q&A. Um, please chime in and ask your questions and and introduce yourself using Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. So the first thing I wanna talk about is just understanding buyers or sellers. Um, uh, you're gonna be on one side of the table or the other. You're gonna be a business owner looking to sell your business. You're going to be a buyer thinking about selling. Uh, but buying and selling a business is very, very different than probably a lot of transactions that you might have experienced in your life, whether it's buying a car or buying or selling a home. Uh, it's a lot more complicated. It can oftentimes be a lot more emotional and it's generally an adversarial process. So even though the buyer and the seller need to cooperate, need to communicate and really need to trust each other, um, they're both working um, and sometimes at different goals. Hey Kelsey, I keep losing this. The, um, you're having a hard time with advancing no. to the next slide? I got it now, thank you. So let's talk about general perceptions from both buyers and sellers. What do buyers want? Buyers are always looking for that perfect biz, uh, business. Sometimes they can't tell me exactly what that is. Sometimes buyers come from out of state, they visit Maine, they fall in love with our state, and then they um, have a sense or an ideal that they wanna own a business here. They can't really express what it might be, but it's going to hit you know, all of their check marks. It needs to provide the income and it needs to provide their lifestyle and it has to be something that they can really enjoy doing. And often they're going to search endlessly for that perfect business because generally no business is going to be perfect. It's going, there's going to be um, things wrong with it or things that aren't quite where they want it to be or it might even be in, in a location that's not ideal for them. But buyers are looking for that perfect business and of course business owners are looking for that buyer has the exact skills that they do that can take over running the business, that can assume the operation and of course have the financial wherewithal to, to buy their business. Buyers want the lowest price and the best terms. And of course, sellers want the highest price or the asking price and the best terms for them. And, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Buyers are generally risk averse, where sellers often don't see any risk in their business. If they've been operating um, their business for five, 10, 20 years of their whole life, 
they see problems, they see problems that they've overcome, but they don't necessarily see that as risks and they don't ever feel like their business is any risk of failing. Uh, but from a buyer that comes from the outside, they're going to want to do an analysis and they're always going to see risks in virtually everything. And maybe the biggest risk is what happens to the business when the current owner leaves, you know, the founder um, or the person that has run the business for a length of time, do customers leave, do employees quit, uh, what changes? Buyers oftentimes are looking for a passive investment. So even in a small business, when they reach out to me, they're looking for a business that has management in place, a general manager, and things uh, can run without them being there every day. Unfortunately, most small businesses just can't be a passive uh, investment. The owner really needs to be in the store. Otherwise, you're going to pay a lot of money to have professional management in place. And for most small businesses, there's probably a limit to what type of management and expertise you can hire. Um, and sellers are going to know that their business really needs to be hands-on. So they don't want to waste their time with a buyer that's just looking uh, to invest money, but not necessarily operate a business. Buyers typically are gravitating towards businesses that have elements or parts of their operation that they really enjoy. Maybe it's as simple as a great location in Maine along the coast, or maybe it's the product they sell, or maybe it's the type of operation that it is. But buyers, don't quite understand that being a business owner means that you've got to wear a lot of different hats. You can't just focus on the one or two things that you enjoy, sales or marketing or managing staff. But for typical small business owners, you've got to wear all of those hats. You have to know a little bit about accounting and a little bit about marketing and a lot of, about managing resources, human and otherwise. So buying a business means really learning a lot of extra roles. Some of them may not be as interesting. I, I talk to a lot of uh, small business owners and I talk to a lot of people that are looking to buy and virtually none of them like accounting. But honestly, to be an effective business owner, you need to master some level of accounting and understand your financials. Buyers want to put as little money down, obviously, and they typically are asking for the seller to provide some seller financing. And business owners generally are resistant to any kind of seller financing initially, but we see from most deals that a, that a seller is going to come in and provide some level of financing, um, typically 10 or 20%. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later when we're talking about deal structure. Buyers don't want to see any issues with the business. Uh, again, it's a, it's a risk aversion um, where sellers see problems with their business as just normal day-to-day -day operations. If, if businesses didn't have problems, you wouldn't need any management at all. It would just run itself. And a lot of buyers want a business that is protected from any type of competition. And generally those are difficult to find. I mean, there's always a level of competition in any industry. Uh, business hates a vacuum. So when you see a business that's highly successful without, little, without a, uh, much competition, you will eventually see competitors move into the market. And sellers know that there's going to be competition and that's just part of running their business. So buyers and sellers have concerns that are really driven by uh, those expectations. Buyers want full disclosure. They want a seller to provide them with all information immediately so they can assess the business. Sellers want a more controlled disclosure. They don't want to put together every aspect of their business and their secret sauce or their customer list until they know that a buyer has progressed along this process that they've made an offer or they're moving ahead to acquire the business. So as a buyer, you can't expect to get every bit of information. And as a seller, you just have to appreciate that you do need to provide some level of information for a buyer to make decisions. Buyers, of course, we just said this, want to pay the lowest price possible and sellers want to receive the highest value. Buyers typically want to talk to staff and perhaps customers or vendors, but sellers know that they need to maintain the confidentiality of the sales and that very early in the process, they don't want uh, just, just a buyer inquiry to come in and impact their business by coming in and talking to their staff and letting it be known they're thinking about selling. So there's another control process too, where the more the buyer gets into the process, the more the seller is willing to give them access to parts of their business. Buyers always want a well-timed closing. Here in Maine, we often see a lot of seasonality um, where no one really wants to buy a business in January, February, March, and everybody wants to acquire a business, learn it, and take over right before the strong season, whether that's the summer season or the fall uh, winter season here in Maine. 
sellers want the quickest close possible. So sometimes even when you find a good match and a buyer finds a, a business they're interested in and the seller uh, knows that the buyer can, can make the acquisition, the closing itself could, do, could be delayed two, three, four, five months because the buyer wants to have an effective closing that works for them from a timeline. Buyers want to assume as little a risk as possible, of course, and sellers want to assume as little a risk as possible, and we'll get into that when we talk about terms. There are tax consequences to buying a business. We're not going to dive into that too much today, um, but part of the negotiation will impact the taxable event, as we call it. So the way the deal is structured could have beneficial tax implications for the buyer, and the way the deal is structured could have beneficial tax advantages for the seller. Unfortunately, they're not the same thing. There's an adversarial relationship there where the structure that benefits the seller will hurt the buyer and vice versa. So that needs to be negotiated out. Okay. So the first question that we ask business owners is, is your business even saleable? So if you own a business, we want it to you to ask these very basic questions. What type of work does it involve? Buyers obviously are attracted to certain types of businesses based on what it entails. Uh, that can change. Um, there's trends, you know, if right now the trades are very um, uh, attractive to buyers because the housing market is still strong. Uh, there's a lot of activity with home improvement and building and construction. But right after th 2009, no one wanted to touch the trades. Um, often buyers are coming to Maine and they're, they are looking for a business that provides a lifestyle. So they want something that might be outdoors, that might be tourist related, that might be again along the coast or in Portland. Um, but there are certain types of work that may not be appealing. If you own a business that cleans porta potties, for instance, to to make an you know an obvious example, that might not attract a lot of buyers. So the type of work that your business does um, will increase or decrease the appeal um, of your business to potential buyers. Do you have accurate? Oh, oh go ahead, Kelsey. Oh, sorry. If I if I may just chime in. Um, uh, yeah, I imagine the part of private business is tough. Um, so there's a Q and A. Um, about what's the typical expectation for sellers to continue working on the business after the sale? Yeah, Ben, that's a good question. So typically for small businesses, uh, a reasonable transition period is the time it takes to properly train the new owner. Now for, and again, I'm being very general here, for smaller businesses, that's typically two to four weeks of full time, the, pre, the seller is going to work full time, typically for free, that, that compensation is built into the sale price. Um, so they would maybe come in two weeks full time, a couple weeks part time, and then make themselves available either through consulting or phone consulting for a period of time after that. My experience has been um, the average is about two to four weeks, but almost always, and I would say 90% of the time, the buyer, once they get their hands around the operation after a week or two, they're really motivated to get the seller out of the business. It's hard to have the previous owner and the new owner um, operating uh, at the same time. Uh, typically the learning curve is a lot quicker because during the due diligence process of, of looking at the business, you get a good sense for the operation anyway. Um, businesses that have employees and systems in place uh, will have some, some policies that allow the business to run while the new owner learns the operation. So to answer your questions, it's typically about a month at the most, okay? So let's talk about the preliminary search. Oh, did I skip one? Yeah, let me go back, I apologize. Uh, another uh, factor that makes a business saleable and not is, is reliable and trained employees. Now, certainly before the pandemic, every business was struggling to even staff. And we saw a lot of acquisition um, activity from other businesses looking to just buy competitors for their staff, their salespeople, their production, uh, people, whatever the type of uh, operation that it was. But having reliable and trained employees is key because often they, they're, they have the institutional knowledge to continue to run the business. They often have the relationships with the clients or the vendors, and they're the people that are running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So if your business is in a situation where a significant number of employees or key people might retire or leave when you do as a seller, then you really need to disclose that because now not, not only does the uh, buyer have to go through 
the acquisition process, financing and due diligence and everything else. But now uh, on the day they take over, they've got to uh, deal with a significant uh, employee turnover. So having those people knowing that they're going to stay on, um, knowing that they're going to be there for the new owners important. Having good working systems. So we just touched on that. But a business should operate with good policies and procedures. That's just that's just sound management practices. So if the business is chaotic or if the business doesn't have good policies in place and the owner or the managers are there really just to solve the same problems on a daily basis, then our advice typically to potential clients is put those procedures in place first before going to market. It's going to help whether it's a policy manual, whether you start um, identifying um, operational issues that need to be addressed by the new owner, but that can be important. Do you have a track record of earnings? The business value will depend on the historic earnings of the company. If the, if the business is, is not making any money or it's losing money, that's really a different type of acquisition that we call a turnaround where the buyer is going to come in with um, more challenges, um, not just taking over the business, but turning it around to make it profitable. Is the owner replaceable? So this is a common one that we see here in Maine. Um, often we see business owners that have an outsized role in their company, whether they are the key provider of a good or service, right? So they're a craftsman or they have a professional certification that means that they're really the only one providing uh, the company's um, services or their name or their relationships uh, with customers or vendors is such that when they leave, it's, it's unknowable the impact it will be, or it could be catastrophic to that business. Um, that's, that puts the seller in, a, in an awkward position. It may make their business unsaleable, that they are the business, and that when they step away from it, there will be material changes that will make it too difficult for a new owner to assume. Um, so sometimes that could just be a business with the owner, operators, the only employee, or it could just be that there's a lot of staff turnover and the owner is is really the is serving all the roles they're the cook the bottle washer and the and they're just they're doing everything the business but if that is the case then probably before going to market a business owner should should try to come up with a solution that allows a new owner to step in and and actually be able to replace them the last thing i want to point out is that there are many many businesses that are saleable they're appealing to a large buyer pool uh, they have good records, good operations, and good earnings, but they decide to eventually go to market uh, and attempt to sell their business or transition out or retire. And a few months later, the business starts deteriorating uh, in operations and it becomes unsaleable. And we see that more often than not, unfortunately, and that's typically because the business owner mentally checks out. Once they decide they want to sell their business, they start pushing away from it psychologically or they don't spend as much attention on it or they start deferring expenses that they just don't want to pay because the assumption is if they sell the business soon, there's no need to put $30,000 into a new roof or to buy a new delivery vehicle or to spend money on a year-long ad campaign or redesign or update the website. But the best advice that I can give business owners is that um, if they decide to go to market, you need to mentally prepare yourself uh, to think that you're going to own it forever. You need to run your business in the normal course of operations and not cut costs or make mistakes uh, or ignore your business in a way. In fact, the best thing to do is when you decide to sell your business is to give it one last push. Go back, spend a little more time, uh, maybe focus on some initiatives that you didn't have the energy for or you just didn't want to bother with. Um, look at every part of the business and, and make sure that it's functional and in good repair and running smoothly. And that will serve you well. It'll make the business more saleable. So let's talk about the preliminary search. And this applies to both, in some ways, both buyer and seller. So when I talk to buyers, uh, my advice is to really narrow down your search. But there's three basic criteria. If you're a buyer, what type of work is appealing? And that also could be where do your skills lie, but if you don't like working with the public, then maybe buying a business that is public oriented is not for you. If you like uh, working Monday through Friday, then a business that focuses or primarily does its, its operations on the weekends or at nights probably isn't a good decision. So really decide what type of work is appealing. If you're a business owner and you're thinking about selling, 
what type, what is appealing about your business because ultimately that's going to uh, sell your business for you. Uh, yes, it is about money, but ultimately buyers are going to make partially a financial decision, but partially an emotional decision when acquiring a business. So what is appealing about your business and how can you show that to potential buyers? The second criteria is cash flow or just profitability for, for lack of a better term here. For a buyer, if you have a minimum income that is required for you to pay your own bills, pay your mortgage, pay your rent, pay your house, your car, your insurance, then the business you're looking at needs to at least provide that level of income. But more importantly, if you're going to, if you need to borrow to acquire the business, then you'll need additional profitability to pay P&I, principal and interest on the loan. And then finally, you don't want to draw every dime or nickel out of the business. You need to leave some in there. It's reserves for fixing things. It's for cap, cap X, as we call it, um, for replacing um, shop worn items or repairs or just dealing with unknowns like the current pandemic. So you can't just suck all the cash out of there. So when you're looking at businesses, and, and let's just use some round numbers, if you need an income of $50,000 a year, and you're going to have principal and interest payments of $20,000 a year on the loan that's needed to acquire the business, then that's 70 right there. And if you want to pad it a little bit more, you probably need to look at businesses that have a cash flow or profitability of 80, 90, $100,000. So if you're starting just looking at businesses that replace your income, something will probably come up short. If you're a seller, understand that the cash flow, and we're going to define that a little later, the profitability of your business will drive the price. And that even if you have an emotional value attached, this is a business that's been your lifelong effort. It's, it's caused trials and tribulations for decades. Um, Buyers, it won't matter to a buyer. The buyers are going to base their valuation based on the future income that the business produces and maybe for some appealing factors of the business, but they're not going to pay you for your emotional attachment and the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into it. So we have to keep that in mind. And the third criteria, finally, is location. So and certainly in real estate, real estate, we say location, location, location. And that is somewhat true for businesses, especially ones that are geographically based, that can't be relocated or are not a internet business or a web-based business. So if you are a buyer, be realistic, right? It's easy to get on the internet and start searching for businesses for sale. And you see something that's, you know, if you're in Portland, you see something that's over in Manchester, New Hampshire, or up in the county. But again, be realistic. Are you, are you willing to relocate? Are you, do you think that a two hour commute every day is reasonable? Um, so it may be that you should narrow your search to a more reasonable uh, geographic area, even if that means excluding some opportunities that look interesting or exciting um, from an advertising perspective. And also understand that if you are a business owner, that your location does matter. If your business is relocatable, that can be a benefit. If it has a large um, or significant portion of its revenue that's done virtually online or through shipping or some other non-geographic basis, that's good as well. But if your business relies on being in a certain market in a certain area, then just like a house, that's going to limit the certain buyers that may not be interested in that location. So those three basic criteria are really going to drive uh, a buyer's search for a business, but it's also going to drive the saleability um, of a business that you might own. So where do businesses buy and sell? Um, typically for any type of commodity or asset, they're sold in markets, whether that's eBay or a car lot or Zillow. Uh, or an antique uh, market somewhere. Those are all markets, virtual or otherwise. So business brokerage works a little bit differently um, for a number of reasons. Typically, buy, uh, business owners are going, want to sell their business confidentially, and if and when they do sell, the terms of that deal aren't typically published. So unlike virtually any other asset, where you can look up what a house sold for on tax records, or you can look in Kelly Blue Book for the value of a used vehicle, there's not that much information about business brokerage, about what businesses sell for. There are some sources, but they're not readily available to the consumers. So that makes it a very inefficient market. It's hard for buyers to find a business when most businesses are being sold confidentially using advertising that's blind, that doesn't uh, give specifics about the business. And it's hard for a seller to find a buyer when they don't want to offer that much information initially 
to protect their privacy and their confidentiality of the sale. So there's three primary markets that um, buyers and sellers find each other. So the first one are trade networks or within the industry. So if you have a plumbing business, it might make sense to look at another plumbing business that's in your same market or look at a plumbing business that's outside of your market where there may be advantages for them to, uh, to acquire your business to gain new market territory or employees or a new product or a new service. There's lots of advantages to that because when you're dealing with an intra-industry um, transaction, both people are, uh, understand the process, they understand the business model, uh, they're talking in the same language, the technical language of plumbing or whatever other type of industry it is. So we don't have to go through the whole explanation of understanding business models. But there's a lot of disadvantages. Going to a competitor, even someone that's outside of your market, um, there may be a risk in disclosing proprietary information or for them learning more about your market and using that sometime in the future. Uh, as a competitive advantage. There's ways to protect that through non-disclosure agreements and non-solicitation of employees, but it's still difficult and there's a real leap of faith for a business owner to go out to their competitors or synergistic businesses in their market or nearby and let them know they're for sale. It's very hard after that to keep it confidential and they could lose, um, they could lose a trade um, deal with a particular vendor or a key client could hear that they're thinking about selling and they could take that as a sign of weakness and start shopping around. So there's a lot of downsides to that um, to find buyers and sellers in the trade network. The second market is in-house. Often a business owner will come to me and say, I've got a key employee and they would be a perfect new owner when I just eventually decide to sell or retire. And that sounds great. But the first question I ask them is, have you actually asked them if they have any interest in buying your business or not? Uh, they may, but the difference often between an owner and an employee is money, and employees are employees for a reason. They don't have the capital to be their own boss, or they may not have the skills. Being a good GM may not, may not be the same as being a good owner. So the benefit of an in-house or key employee is they are already groomed through the process and they understand the operation. They, uh, they have a relationship with their uh, boss, the owner. Um, so all of those relationships and, um, and understanding of the operation are there, but there's a big hurdle and typically that's financial. So when a business owner approaches a key employee, uh, they're often left with having to provide a significant amount of financing because if they're not qualified or, or well qualified, um, to acquire a bank loan, then the seller is going to need to step in and they may not have that option. They may need the proceeds of a sale to fund their retirement. They may need the proceeds of their sale to do something else, or they may need the proceeds of the sale to retire some debt prior to retiring. So acting as the bank and playing the bank for their key employee just may not be an option at all. So there's a lot that can go wrong. And the, and the uh, risk here is that they can deteriorate or damage the relationship between a key employee and the business owner. So not only now has, has the sale not been affected, but perhaps the key employee leaves because they're embarrassed, they weren't able to cons consummate the transaction, or they felt like the owner wasn't giving them a mu as much seller financing or price um, decrease that they think they deserve for helping them build and grow their business over so many years. And that can happen and I've seen it happen. So there's a risk there too. And then finally, the third market where buyers and sellers find each other is this general market, oftentimes through the internet, through advertising. It's, it allows a business owner to reach a na uh, national or a worldwide market of potential buyers. Uh, for a buyer, it allows you to search all over the country, especially if you are willing to relocate. Um, Certainly, if you do a couple searches, you realize there's hundreds and if not thousands of businesses for sale, so it can be a little overwhelming. But there are disadvantages. The internet is fantastic for buyers and sellers to find each other, but that's as far as it goes. The internet doesn't really allow uh, a buyer and seller to start a disclosure process or to trust each other or for the buyer to get a true sense of the business. And they certainly, it's, it's much more difficult to do uh, over long distances. So, you know, I, I tell business owners, if you try to sell your business on the internet, using the internet only, what, what's the next step after a potential um, inquiry comes in, right? The buyer's going to say, send me your tax returns or send me some other proprietary information. Um, 
as a business owner, do you really want to email your federal documents or other types of uh, confidential information about your business to an unknown, right? So the seller wants to know more about the buyer, the buyer wants to know more about the business, and that is a very difficult thing to do um, over email, over the internet, especially given all the amount of fraud and, and other things that we have can occur. So at some point, this needs to become a more personal process. So that general market just using the internet oftentimes stops at just the marketing part and doesn't allow the deal to get uh, to move forward. So you, looking at those three markets, our advice to business owners is not to go to what is seemingly the easiest, the trade networks or a key employee, but our advice is to go to the general market, cast as wide a net as possible to identify the most potential buyers. There's a good chance that people will come up with a value proposition for your business. That, so that will give you a sense of what the market is seeing for the value of your business, no matter what your asking price is. And there's also less risk of losing confidentiality because often you're gonna be dealing with out-of-state buyers or people outside your market or just arm's length um, uh, transaction. If that doesn't work, then it, pro it is probably prudent to go uh, to a trade network to within the industry. And there's ways to do that uh, that I'm not gonna dive into here that can protect your confidentiality, but still gives you a chance to explore that as a potential um, avenue for selling your business. And if those don't work, then finally, especially if your key employee has shown no interest in buying your business, finally go to a key employee as sort of a last measure because that one could be, um, that could do the most damage if if process doesn't work. Okay. So those are the markets. So let's talk about the process once a buyer and seller find each other. So what I have found is the buyers ask three basic questions. Um, sometimes four that we have here. But the big three questions are, how long has the business been on the market? Now that's a common question or a common metric in real estate, but I think it's left without context in business brokerage. So if it, um, I ha we haven't really dived into this, but if I were to tell you that it takes on average nine months to 18 months to sell a business, for a lot of people that might come as a surprise, especially when we're living in a real estate market here in Southern Maine where um, a desirable property might go under contract in 48 hours. Business just works different. It's a slower, more methodical process. So when a buyer asks me how long the business uh, has been on the market, I mean, I could answer five days and they might think that's too long, or I could say six weeks and they think that's an eternity. But really time on market is not a real good indication of the quality of the business or any other issue about scalability. Then a buyer will often ask, why are they selling the business, right? Why would anybody sell a great business? Well, people don't need really a lot of reasons. They may just want to ch uh, make a lifestyle change. They may be bored. They may want to do something else. There may be a personal issue with family or health that they don't want to disclose. So again, you know, it's, it's a question. People ask it, but it's not that informative. And then finally, can you send me the tax returns? Well, tax returns are often not the most informative documents about the finances. We'll get into that. Uh, profit and loss statements can be a lot more granular and provide a lot more information uh, to a potential buyer. And uh, again, often uh, business owners are not going to want to just hand over tax returns on the initial inquiry. So what I found is those three questions, the, the, the first two, why are they selling and how long has the business been on the market? That's not really what buyers are asking. What buyers are asking is what's wrong with the business? And that's just a polite way of doing so. So understand that the, the due diligence and process around examining a business, if done correctly, will uncover any issues. And that when you eventually get to a closing, there are legal documents to protect a buyer from a seller hiding material facts or not, or not disclosing material facts. Um, so there are ways to protect both buyers and sellers from fraud um, that we will get to. And then finally, I just want uh, to touch on the last, the buyer typically wants a showing because again, that's pretty common real estate. Now, if the business is open uh, to the public, then I encourage them to go in anonymously as a customer and, and look at it from that perspective. But until the process moves along a little further, maybe we have a shared sense of, of value so we know that the buyer and seller are in the same ballpark, um, or there's there's been si uh, substantial uh, or multiple meetings between the buyer and seller, the showing can wait till later, right? Um, it's, there runs a risk of 
breaching confidentiality or alerting the employees that there's something going on and employees are pretty sensitive to that. So we try to stay away from showings and, and ultimately if there are multiple buyers, you can't just parade multiple people through a business and keep telling your employees that they're health inspectors or insurance adjusters. They're, they're not gonna buy that. So the showing really occurs much later in the process. Uh, and there are items that a buyer can examine and a seller can provide to allow them to assess the business and whether they have further interest in it. So if those are not great questions, what questions should a buyer ask and what questions should a seller be prepared to answer? So the first one seems kind of obvious and silly, but it's important. What is for sale? So sure, the business is for sale, but what does that include? Does that include intellectual property, if, if that's a part of the business, the customer list, uh, the artwork on the wall, um, the truck in the parking lot that also plows the snow in the winter, or is that a personal vehicle of the owner? So we want to be very clear on what is being offered in the sale. Uh, two, how is the price and value determined? So if you own a business, yes, there's probably a price you would like to get, or there is a price you need to get to retire or to do something else, but that may be disconnected from what the value of your business is. So it's fair for a buyer to say, how did you get to that price? Can you walk me through that? And a little bit later, we're gonna talk about some a basic valuation method, but um, there are understood principles to valuing a business. And if a seller says, well, that's what I want, or that's what I need, that's not a great answer. You should be able to walk them through and say, how does this, how does this value tie into the profitability and the cash flow of the business? And the third question a buyer would should ask is what information is available? And a seller should be able to provide basic levels of documentation, we call basic due diligence, to allow the, the potential buyer to examine the business from a financial perspective and an operational perspective to decide whether they want to buy it or not. So what does that basic due diligence look like? Generally, a profit and loss statement for the last three years can be the end of year profit and loss summary. It doesn't have to be by the day or the week, um, unless the business has a real seasonality or is only open a few months a year, and then it might be more limited in scope, but typically three years of profit and loss. Depending on when we are in the current fiscal year, a current year to date, date performance. So in January, it's probably not that important, but now we're in you know, September and October, so buyers are going to want to see where the business has been for the last nine months, especially the impact of the pandemic um, on the business operations. Customer or product mix, uh, without defining exactly who the customers are, they can be customer one, customer two, customer three, but one of the things that might be important for a buyer to know is if there's a customer concentration. If, if a single customer or source um, is responsible for 20% or more of your business. And again, that can change from industry to industry, but a customer concentration um, can be a critical factor. If that customer leaves when the current owner retires or moves on, then that has a significant material impact on the business. So that should be disclosed. A list of assets or basically what's for sale that we just discussed. What is included in this business for assets, tangible and intangible, right? So it doesn't just have to be hard items like desks, chairs, and computers. It can be intangible assets too, like the trade name, the website, the 1-800 number, uh, intellectual property, and those types of intangible uh, assets. Basic real estate details, if you lease or own the property, whether the property is for sale or included in the, the business, um, what is that gonna look like for the new owner? Are they leasing it? What, what will they pay for a lease rate? Is the lease transferable? So those basics. And then finally, just general employee information. What is everybody's roles? Are they getting paid hourly? Do they have benefits? Is it a salary? So not full name, social security numbers and, and detailed payroll records, but enough that a buyer understands the ebb and flow of the operations, the staff coverage, and who does what and where the critical employees lie. And that basic information there for again, it's a general list for most businesses, should provide a buyer enough information to determine if they have further interests and even gives them enough information to put together uh, an opinion of value. So if you're a buyer and you get that information, that should, should give you enough to keep the process going. And if you're a seller, that is the basic information you should be prepared to supply in a timely manner. So, if a buyer finds a business that isn't willing to share any of this information, my advice is to turn around and leave. 
Um, maybe they're hiding something, maybe they're not, but that low level of cooperation is probably indicative of what the whole process will look like in the future. And that's probably someone you're going to have a difficult time negotiating with or dealing with. Okay. So let's talk about valuation. So first off, businesses are structured, business sales are structured as either an asset sale or a stock sale. We're generally going to talk, talk about asset sales, but let me just throw out sort of the broad understanding. Almost no businesses now are structured as a stock sale. A stock sale is when the buyer purchases the stocks or the certificates of the company, right? So it's like going on the stock market and buying four shares of Ford Motor Company. In a, in a private transaction, you are buying the corporation, the LLC, the C Corp, the S Corp of, of the company and all of its assets, okay? That's not done anymore for one particular reason. By structuring the deal as a stock sale, you're assuming unknown liabilities, specifically tort liabilities. So in Maine, the statute of limitation on tort is seven years. So that means if you were to acquire a business through a stock sale, six months after you own the business, an employee from five years ago could show up and say they had a slip and fall in the warehouse, and now that's going to be a claim against the business you own, all right? And that's the primary reason we don't see stock sales anymore. There are tax advantages for a business owner to sell and structure the deal as a stock sale. But again, most buyers, if not all buyers, are, will never be instructed by their attorney to structure it as an asset sale. So let's talk about that. So an asset sale is when the buyer is purchasing all of the assets, tangible and intangible, but not the stock of the company itself. So the buyer forms a new co, a new company. They structure it based on the advice of an attorney. It could be an LLC, again, or a sub S or C Corp. And think of it like an empty bowl. And at the closing, the business owner basically pours all of the stuff of their business that's in, that's in their bowl into the new buyer's empty bowl. And that is an asset sale. So the assets, and again, they're tangible and intangible assets, are, are um, transferred free and clear. Hey, Kelsey, do I have a question? Did I see something? Does an asset sale usually come with a non-compete for the seller to prevent them? Yes, 100%. So whether it's an asset sale or a stock sale, um, the non-compete can be a critical component of the deal. And we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit in terms of all of the definitive documents that, it, that go with the sale, okay? All right, so in an asset sale, the buyer is not assuming, unless they choose to, unless there's part of a negotiation, they're not assuming any liabilities. So at the time of close or prior to close, the seller pays off all the debts, encumbrances or liabilities on the assets they're being transferred. So they're transferred free and clear. And so under the asset sale, the buyer is starting on day one with a brand new company with no unknown past liabilities. Um, and all of the assets they own free and clear besides any encumbrances from any uh, bank lending that they took on to acquire the business, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So let's talk about some basic concepts in, in terms of a business sale. So when we value businesses, um, there may or may not be three different components, real estate, inventory, and the business itself. Each one of those components is, uses a different valuation uh, methodology. So if you see a business for sale or you're thinking about selling your business, we price those separately. Now we can add it all up into what we call an enterprise value for the entire um, business and all of its uh, components. But from a valuation standpoint, we wanna make sure we value discreetly because just putting a lump sum on a business can hide pricing disparities um, that we wanna uncover. So I'm not gonna get uh, into real estate valuation. That's a, I think that's a, a college degree. So we're not gonna get into that, but understand that there are very clear ways to value commercial property and, and real estate in general. Inventory um, is valued at its cost, not at its sell price. It's very hard to buy everything at retail and turn around and sell it at retail and make any money. Um, so inventory is valued at uh, it's cost, I apologize for a second, I want to go 
see the next slide, um, of what we call clear and saleable inventory. So if you have inventory that's old, if you have inventory that was sitting in a window and is faded, if you have returns that are in a box that's crushed, that's not what we would call clear and saleable inventory. So it's a cost and clear and saleable. Um, and then finally, the business itself, and we're going to get to that in the next couple slides. Cash and receivables. In an asset sale, the, the business owner keeps the cash in the bank and the receivables. The receivables, all receivables are is money they have not yet received for goods or services they've already provided. So that's theirs as well, right? So if you look at the business you're acquiring and they've got $50,000 sitting in their checking account, that stays with the seller. That doesn't come along with the deal unless you wanna pay $50,000 for $50,000 in cash. Finally, we're gonna talk about owner discretionary expenses. So many small business owners run non-business related expenses through their business. They do this for tax reasons to reduce their taxable income. Um, that's generally why they do it. So we, sometimes we see uh, fishing boats and airplanes or vacations or personal health care or uh, personal automobiles or family cell phones. They get run through the business. What we want to do is identify those because the new owner can continue that practice or they could have their own discretionary expenses, but those are non-business related expenses. Those are just run through the business for tax reasons and they don't actually have a material impact on the business. They're not a direct business expense. And most businesses have some level of that, but it can distort the financial performance of the business. Because again, the business owner is trying to reduce their taxable income to pay less taxes. And to do that, you need to make your business look less profitable. As a seller, you probably want to try the different direction and make your business um, accurately profitable. And by uh, identifying what your discretionary expenses are, it helps the buyer assess uh, the opportunity uh, more clearly. And then finally, we're going to use terms like EBITDA and EBITDA O. So earnings before interest taxes, amortization, depreciation. These are accounting terms and they're basically, we want a clear idea of profitability before distortions um, that are provided by tax law, like depreciation or amortization, or taxes, which is dependent on the owner of the business, right? A corporation could own a smaller business and pay a different tax bill than a single individual owner could. Or a single individual owner could have passive losses that they could write off against their business gains or business profits. So taxes are distorting. Yes, if the business is profitable, generally you're gonna play, pay taxes on it, but we want to look at the profitability before taxes come out, because again, they're owner dependent, before depreciation is adjusted, because that's an IRS allowance, before amortization, because that's a non-cash deduction. So we want this clean number of profitability. And it's, it's, there's many interchangeable terms. Sometimes it's called cash flow to owner. Sometimes it's called SDE, sell the discretionary earnings. There's probably 50 of names that we can come up with. But to keep it technical, we're going to use EBITDA and EBITDA O. We'll get into that in just a second. So for a buyer examining a business or even a seller understanding their financials better, we want to recast the financials that we are given um, and we want to recast them to a, a new one owner situation. So um, oftentimes businesses are run by partners or husband and wives. Um, where there might be only be one salary taken, but both people are uh, assuming roles and actual real jobs in the company or family members may be helping out in a busy season or kids may work during the season. It, there could be a lot of things to distort um, some of the expenses for the business. There can be uh, discretionary expenses we just talked about. Uh, the business owner could own the real estate and, and pay themselves rent that's that's either higher or lower than fair market value. So there's a number of things that can distort the financial um, profit and loss of a business. So what we want to do is recast it and say, what is this business going to look like when the new owner takes over? If they don't run any discretionary expenses, so we want a pure snapshot of those business financials. We want to examine the cost of goods. Do they look normal for the industry? Why would cost of goods matter? or Why would it change with a new owner? Maybe the current owner has a favorable trade deal that they can't transfer to a new owner. So for instance, we just uh, did some work with the Dairy Queen and the Dairy Queen contract for the product 
uh, was a 20 year old contract that Dairy Queen will not honor anymore. It was grandfathered in. The new owner basically had to negotiate a new trade deal with Dairy Queen and that changed their profitability for the business for them. So cost of goods can change. We want to examine all the expenses, not only what expenses are there, but what expenses aren't there. If the, if the business owner's cousin is doing all the snow plowing and grounds work for free, uh, the new owner probably will not get that same deal. So we want to make sure that expenses that the business is incurring are, are shown on the profit and loss statement. And we want to make sure that one-time expenses or expenses that aren't business related, like discretionary expenses, are taken out. So we have, a, a, again, a snapshot of what this business looks like from a purely business standpoint and not being distorted by what the, what the previous owner did or potentially what the new owner might want to do um, once they... Uh, by the business. When we get that recast financial, then we can see what the true profitability is before taxes, depreciation, and amortization, and interest expense, and we can come up with a value to the business. So usually I can walk the class through in a workshop and we, we can go through some case studies. In this case, I can't do that. So what I wanted to show is sort of this static view of uh, a, a very basic profit and loss for a business, okay? And we have the actual numbers from the end of the year of 2018, and this is a very basic recast, but I wanted to, to illustrate how things might change. So I've highlighted the numbers that we did change based on information provided through due diligence. So the insurance and liability general and workers' comp insurance for the new owner has dropped significantly by about $45,000. Why is that? The owner basically identified the fact that their family health insurance, dental, and all of their vehicle insurance and other types of insurance were being paid for by the same comprehensive policy of the business. So the new owner, again, could elect to run their own personal insurance through it, but that's not, that's a discretionary decision and nothing to do with the business itself. The real cost of insurance for this business is $185,000. Um, payroll non-owner. So the wife in this case was being uh, compensated but wasn't doing any work in the business uh, just to meet Social Security um, contribution requirements. So we removed that and lowered payroll non-owner by $25,000. Rent increased. So in this situation, the business owner owns the real estate and was just paying themselves a nominal rent because they own the property free and clear. However, based on current market rates, the new owner of the business would be required to pay a lease it's subject to some negotiation of $105,000 a year. So rent would go up significantly for the new owner. There was no repairs and maintenance that was done through a separate company. So we added back a reasonable level of repairs and maintenance for the facility under a triple net lease. Uh, travels, meals, and entertainment are discretionary typically for this business. We didn't see it as a real marketing angle, so that was removed. Uh, vehicle fuel and maintenance, there was some personal vehicles that were in this uh, cost structure that were removed. And miscellaneous, there was a lot of discretionary stuff. So once we clean that up, and this is again a very basic example, um, we can see that, all right, we reduced some costs but others increased. So it wasn't quite a wash, but it, but it did change profitability where under the previous owner, we could argue cash flow to owner was the $260,000, $270,000 range, but for a new owner, that actual profitability be reduced by thirty or forty thousand dollars, and that has a real impact on the asking price of the business. Okay, let me just pull up. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing missing any questions, Kelsey. Yep, yep. I think um, you yeah you had touched you had touched on the asset sale one earlier, correct? Yep. We're going to talk about okay. one of this in a little bit. Okay, so, thank you. Sure. So the three components of business, uh, of business valuation are real estate, inventory, and the business itself. So I just, I touched quickly on inventory and real estate we're going to ignore for the purposes of this workshop. So I wanted to, to introduce you to a very simple rule of thumb for business valuation, which um, is fairly accurate. It's going to get you within two, maybe three standard deviations of a more complicated process. So consider like 85 or 90% um, accuracy rate versus doing a much more involved um, business valuation. And those are earning multiples. And basically it says that a business is worth X times its annual earnings. All right. Now, 
if we were to lump all small businesses between you know, zero revenue to $5 million in revenue, these main street businesses, we were to lump them all together, all of the sales transactions for the last 20 years and average them all up. The average for, for small businesses is 2.4. Businesses sell for 2.4 times their cash flow. Okay, so we wanted to find cash flow a little bit better, um, but I wanted to, to get that range. If you're familiar with the stock market, um, we often see a, a, an EPS, earnings per share multiple, and sometimes, for instance, with Amazon or Tesla, it could be a thousand times earnings. Those are much higher multiples, but those are much larger companies, access to international markets of credit and professional management and public borrowing capacity. So there's really no comparison. Small businesses are inherently risky. They don't have in-house corporate counsel, often don't, aren't large enough to have human resource departments and accounting departments. They are susceptible to macroeconomic trends, to exchange rate risk, to shipping risk, and just lack of capital risk. So small businesses tend to value on the lower end on the, on, than a business that might be worth 50 or $100 million. So it's a little common sense, but I think um, I, I, see, I, I often see business owners surprised. They feel like uh, that's a very low way to value their business. It's, the, the common question to me is, well, I could run my business for two to three years and shut it down and I would have the same thing. Yes, that's right. That's correct. It's a hamster wheel in a business. Unless you do things to the business to make it more interesting, profitable or enticing, it's always going to be that multiple between two and three times on average. And when you stop, that's what the, the sale price is going to be. So let's tying it all together. We need to know what, the, what we mean when we say the cash flow of the business. Of, to which we can apply a multiple. And cash flow of the business is EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, taxes, depreciation, amortization, plus owner salary or owner's compensation. So again, if the owner is taking compensation instead of a paycheck, but they're paying their personal vehicle through the business, that's the same thing as, as taking um, a paycheck for compensation. And we add all of that up, we get this SD, seller discretionary earnings or EBITDA O, if we want a technical acronym. And once we have that number, uh, we, were, we will apply the, the business multiple the, and to get to the value, plus the value of the inventory, if applicable, plus the value of the real estate. So in this chart, I just used three as a placeholder. And again, that multiple could range depending on the type of business. So there are online databases that provide us, um, their subscription base that provide us a way to uh, run searches and see what average multiples look like. And, and averages are much more useful. You can always find a business that sells for a huge premium or another business that gets sold at a discount. Maybe uh, you know, there's a, there could be a story behind that, a health issue, a crisis of some sort, or just a speculative bubble. So we wanna look at multiple transactions so we can get a more accurate reading on, on what a multiple might be. So in this case, I ran a report for food markets um, between I think two to four, $5 million in revenue. So this would be comparable to like a small Hannaford's or a small IGA market. And if you look at this report, the bottom section here, Kelsey, can my cursor be seen? Let's see. see cursor. Um, are you moving the cursor? I'm moving my cursor. No? Yeah, I can, I can see it, but it's pretty, yeah, I can see it, but it's pretty small. Yep. I'm just curious. So this bottom section are six actual sales of a business by the SIC code and the, and the type of business they are and their gross sales, the SDA, that's the seller discretionary earnings or EBITDA -O that we just discussed. So it breaks all sorts of things down, but we're interested in averages and that's where the middle section transaction summary is important. And so what I've labeled I here is the average multiple, the mean. So these types of markets are a little on the higher side, right? So they typically sell for 3.1 times cash flow. And we can run, run these reports on uh, using uh, SIC codes or NAICS industry standard codes. Uh, and again, I'm happy to do that. If anybody, I, I have a subscription to this. So if anybody wants me to run an industry code, I pay a lot for the subscription. And I don't use it that often. So I am happy to run it free of charge. Um, and you can just email me for that through SCORE. Uh, but this is only one tool. We also have local sales. Uh, so we, we have a sense for it um, as well. So we there, there's a bit of an art, but typically um, there are also this, this macroeconomic trends too. So in 2009, after the, uh, the economy bottomed out, we saw most business multiples drop to the low twos, no matter what they were. And 
In 2007, right before that crash, we were seeing multiples that were in the high twos or even threes to three and a halfs. Right now, even with the pandemic, we we're seeing business values hold um, as long as they weren't or they're not being materially threatened by a shutdown or the COVID. So businesses that are still performing, that even if they are impacted, we're seeing we're seeing slightly above average normal multiples in the high two range because we still have, we've had a strong economy for the last eight or nine years. Um, consumer spending has remained strong. Uh, bank lending is active and interest rates are low. So it's still um, a lot of good metrics for buying or selling a business. So what else? can adjust your business value besides just the profitability. And these are what we call value drivers. Uh, and these are things that we've, we sort of touched upon earlier in the workshop. Attractive or interesting work, a good strong market position, even if you have competition, but a good location or just a dominant um, market position. Proprietary technology or an interesting product that might not be easily duplicatable. A good location, strong operating systems, stability, so all of those things, the, the more of those that you can hit in a positive way, they can adjust the value of your business. Maybe not taking that multiplier from a 2.4 to a 2 to a 3.5, but certainly getting up in the higher ranges and that can help. And it also uh, not just impacts the actual value or price of your business, it actually makes it more appealing and to a broader range of people. And the, the more potential buyers you have, the better chance you have of selling and the better chance you have of selling at an asking price or um, a strong value. And by the way, these are all things that just are good, common, you know, best practices for running a business, right? Having a strong market position and good operating systems and trained employees and good books and, and information systems. Those are all things that, you know, we generally encourage small business owners to, to do anyway. So let's talk about negotiations. So there are multiple areas that have to be negotiated. Uh, there was a question earlier about um, non-competes, we'll talk about. But the initial document that really needs to be addressed first is what we call an LOI, a letter of intent, uh, or it could be called a term sheet. And it's really an agreement to agree. There can be some binding langu language in there, but typically it's too early in the process um, to put too many penalties or contingencies in that bind one party or the other. So what we do want to do, do is, is try to lock down as many elements as we can to avoid further reopen negotiations down the, down the road. All right, so we want, to get a, we want to get a price. And again, that price may be dependent on further due diligence or changes in the business or some other um, real impact. The allocation, which is which is a, uh, the taxable proportion, is how we proportion out the deal structure from, from a tax basis. And again, I don't want to get into too much today. Uh, a target closing date. So those basic um, ideas, and it's the buyer and seller agreeing to those, but understanding that somewhere down the line that could change, but out of changing circumstances and not bad faith on either party's part. So it doesn't say, well, we're gonna renegotiate price later because I want to. This sets the terms and it allows the buyer to approach lenders and say, I've got agreed upon terms as a basis for a lending application. There can be some contingencies. Uh, they are one of the most important are what we call third party consents, meaning a third party, someone that's not the buyer or the seller that may have some interest in the transaction. So it could be a landlord, who may or may not agree to lease to the new owner. It could be a leasing company for a fleet of vehicles. It could be a vendor that's supplying a certain product. It could be licensing from a, a municipality or, a, or the federal government that has to approve. So it's not necessarily they will, they will deny the transaction, but they have a say in it. And so we wanna make sure that we've clarified what those third party consents are and we have to deal with them in, in fairly short order because you don't want to get closer to a close when both buyer and seller have incurred costs, both legal and accounting and, and time, and then find out there's a third party that just refuses to transfer a, a, an agreement or just doesn't agree to play along with the deal. So we want to make sure that that gets clarified. Other contingencies that are common, of course, are like financing contingencies. The buyer may uh, put a contingent, contingency in that they need to get bank financing of 80% loan to value or or something similar to that. There is typically a deposit, a good faith deposit provided by the buyer that is put into a 
uh, recognized escrow account, typically with a broker or an attorney. Uh, that is not a non-refundable deposit, although parts of it could be made refundable over time per this agreement, uh, but it's showing good faith on the buyer's part. The buyer may also ask for what they, we, we call a no-shop clause or an exclusivity clause, basically saying, listen, I'm putting a good faith deposit down, we've agreed to terms, and we've executed this letter of intent. At the same time, I have a lot of work to do. I've got to do due diligence, I have to go to banks, I probably have to look at giving a, a notice to my job just in case. And I, there's just a lot of things that I now have to perform um, on my side for responsibilities. So I want you to take this business off the market for a reasonable amount of time so I can get these things done. Because what I don't want to do is, is start all of these processes and for you to take my offer and to shop it to other people in the hopes of bidding it up or getting a slightly higher offer. And that's a fair and reasonable expectation for a buyer. Uh, businesses rarely have multiple offer situations. At the same time, a seller can still use a legitimate written offer that's agreed to to try to drum up interest through other uh, buyers that may not be as far along in the process or um, have just initially opened an inquiry. However, from the seller side, taking the business off the market has a real cost as well. So that's where some of that deposit may be forfeited. And the seller may say, look, you're, you're putting down a good faith deposit, a deposit of $5,000. I think $2,000 of that should be immediately non-refundable in return for an eight-week exclusivity. And so there's a little bit of a negotiation there, but both parties are incurring some costs and they're incurring some risk, but they're sharing both of those. And that's a fair way to go forward. Okay, so that's the LOI. And once that is signed and executed by both parties, and then we really have a basis for moving ahead to a potential closing. After that LOI is signed, we go into full due diligence. So we talked about the basic due diligence, so the information that a buyer needs to really determine if this is a, uh, an opportunity they want to pursue. So full due diligence really starts after that LOI, and that's when the buyer is entitled to a much broader and deeper level of documentation and information from the business. Depending on the business or the industry, there may be some still there still may be some reasonable holdbacks whether it's intellectual property or very specific customer lists or secret ingredients or something similar that the buyer and seller identify as, as not being transferred until there's a clear closing and the deal is locked into place. But at this point, the buyer is entitled to all the reasonable information, you know, insurance binders, full, full payroll records, um, detailed profit and loss statements. They will probably want to verify sales tax payments to verify income if that's applicable in the business. So again, it's industry specific, but uh, the buyer now wants to start verifying all of the information the seller provided. And this is where there's no, there's no real avenue here for the seller to hide things or for there to be a shoe to drop that, that the buyer's not gonna know about. This is typically full disclosure. And the, that disclosure will then be put into a purchase and sale agreement later on to make sure that nothing was held back um, or kept hidden. Okay. Now, as much as much uh, right that the buyer has to demand this information, I also want to make it clear that the seller it's it's incumbent upon them to provide this information in a timely manner, because dragging this out, not being able to produce accurate records, that will probably kill the deal. So be prepared to to answer and respond to reasonable due diligence uh, requests in a timely manner. You know, if they ask for P&Ls by the month for the last year and it takes you two or three months to provide that to them, then there's probably going to be a problem. So these are systems that we want to put into place. We want a business owner to have in a place prior to going to market. So they're not spending months with their accountant trying to suddenly update their accounting systems to provide timely reports. Okay. So the LOI was the first item to be negotiated. The second one that starts being prepared after the LOI is the purchase and sale agreement. This is the definitive document, right? This is the bill of sale. This document has, uh, has all the schedules for all the assets being transferred, uh, UCC um, uh, information, all of it. A lot of legal, a lot of legal language, 
Um, but this is it, this is the defining document. This needs to be pre prepared by attorneys. We typically like to see the buyer prepare the first draft because there is a cost to that, to hire an, an attorney, but it also shows commitment on the buyer's part that they're just not wasting the seller's time. The attorneys will typically negotiate a lot of items in here. So the more that was agreed to in the LOI, the less the attorneys have to negotiate, which translates into less chance of the deal falling apart and lower legal fees, which I think benefits both buyer and seller. So the one thing that I, that I want to convey about the purchase and sales is this last item that we call reps and warranties or representations and warranties. So both parties make representations in, in the purchase and sale agreement. Now these aren't reps and warranties. These aren't items like if you buy this business, it's going to remain profitable or nothing will ever break. So they're not like product warranties. What, they're, what, they're, what you're representing are items like, I own this business and I own the property that I'm transferring to you. Um, I own the business and I don't have any known environmental uh, impacts or pollution on my property that I caused. Or I have no notices or have I had any notices of sexual harassment claims or any other types of liability. So those types of things. Um, those are the representations. The, typically the buyer makes fewer representations because they're just on the buy side. And then the warranties are the second part. It is what happens if either buyer or seller breaches the representations they make. And that's typically defined by two things, time and money. So a buyer or a buyer's attorney typically wants the seller to make uh, all of their representations with no time limit and no limits on damages. And the seller's attorney wants the limits to be seven days and one dollar, but they tend to go back and forth and they typically agree on 18 months and about half the value of the deal. Now, what that means is those are just setting limits. That doesn't imply that if the seller breaches their representations, the buyer is automatically entitled to half the value of the deal. It's just setting ceilings on things so we don't have unlimited litigation in the future. However, a well-written reps and warranties written by a competent attorney is going to protect both buyer and seller for, again, these, these material disclosures that both parties fear, that what are they not saying? And at this point, there shouldn't be anything that is unknown in the deal. There should have been enough due diligence, enough documentation supplied, and also trust between both buyer and seller, plus the inspection of third parties like banks that are also looking at the deal and that are doing title searches and looking at uh, tax payments in the past. It's very unusual to hide something. And if they do, both buyer or seller, there is language in the definitive agreement to protect the other party. So there are our ancillary agreements that also have to be negotiated. The first one's non-compete, which someone had asked about. Of course, a buyer does not want to buy a business and then have the seller move down the street and reopen the business or hire back all their old employees or provide a similar good or service to their customer list that could have an impact on the business they sold. So it goes without saying that the seller has to provide some level of non-compete. But the level of non-compete has to be reasonable or it will never be enforceable in a court of law. So if, this, if the buyer is asking for a non-compete that lasts 20 years and 5,000 miles, unless it's a very specific type of business, chances are that's going to be non-enforceable. So I would tell the other party to agree to it because it will never hold up in court. So typically a reasonable level is something like two to five years and five to 20 miles, depending on the type of business it is. Reasonable. Of course, if the seller's goal all along is to sell the business and then immediately go into competition, it would, it's, the hope would be that that would come out during the due diligence process, that that is, you know, there's an implication of, you know, of being sneaky and dishonest. So, uh, but the non-compete should also be drafted by attorneys. All of these documents should. These are not the type of documents you want to trust in downloading from legal Zoom or to draft them yourself. Leases have to be negotiated. If there is a third party landlord, uh, they may or may not allow the lease to be transferred. Here in Portland, Maine, landlords use uh, ownership changes to renegotiate a lease, typically at a higher rate. Um, they don't allow leases to be transferred. We're seeing less and less language to allow for that. Um, so that has to be negotiated. 
if the seller uh, is required to stay on for any period of time, maybe because they have they hold a special license or there's a technical aspect to what they do, or they are going to be kept on the masthead uh, for marketing reasons and to be the elder statesman or spokesman of the business, then there's typically an employment agreement. And that needs to be drafted. It's not just as simple as what is their compensation, but what would be cause for releasing them? Are there benefits involved? Those types of things. And finally, if there's any level of seller financing, which is when this, the business owner provides some financing to the buyer, typically a, what we call gap financing. So gap, gap financing would be what the buyer brings to the table for down payment, what a bank or third party lender is willing to supply. That gap, the asking price may or may not be provided by the seller. Um, for the last few years, it's been pretty typical to see about 10 to 20% of the agreed upon deal to be financed by the seller. Um, but again, it will be it'll depend, banks are lending aggressively now. So we've seen some deals that it doesn't require any seller financing at all. But if the seller does finance, that's a promissory note. It's a, it's a lending document, just like uh, you would have when you're borrowing money from a bank. And that is a uh, financial instrument, it's a debt note. So that needs to be drafted by an attorney too. So all of these items need to be Negotiated, right? Seller financing, typically, there's going to be terms and interest rate. Uh, consulting and employment, there's going to be salary and compensation. Leases will be a whole separate negotiation. And then the non-compete, as we already discussed. So these are all on top of the definitive agreement, the purchase and sale, uh, that needs to be negotiated uh, through the lawyers. So after closing, there can be some post-closing items. There might be some escrow money as part of the deal held aside. Sometimes the buyer requires part of the purchase price to be held back until they are properly trained. Sometimes there's just inventory that is changing so quickly that it would be difficult to pin down an exact number the day of close. So it's easier to assess what that number is the day after or a couple of days after when all the records can be put together. Sometimes there's prepaid expenses or there might be benefit packages that have to be resolved or rolled up. So there can be a number of things that require some of the proceeds to be escrowed. There is a training and transition period. And as I think the first, first person asked, uh, typically for these small businesses, um, the, the buyer, excuse me, the seller has to provide a, um, a level of training to allow the buyer to run the business. So that goes without saying. And again, that typically can take two to four weeks of full-time effort on the seller's behalf. They're working for free as part of their part of the deal uh, for that period. And then there may be some declining commitment, whether it's phone consulting or something similar that might keep you know, that might continue for a year or two. Um, and again, that needs to be negotiated. Post-closing empl employment and consulting. Again, um, if there is a, an employment agreement with the, with the seller, right, there needs to be a process by which uh, they're getting paid and they're performing uh, per the negotiation. And if there is an opportunity to uh, retire them out of the business, how that process works. And then finally, if there's seller financing, there needs to be, or an earnout. And an earnout is basically seller financing based on the performance of the business. So the seller would need some way to audit the numbers to make sure they're getting paid properly, um, or that there's a seller note that needs to be paid. And if, if there's a balloon payment owed in a couple of years, that needs to be tracked and made sure that um, the buyer performs on that seller note. So the buyer and seller relationship will often continue far past the actual closing. And that could be two months, but it could be a year. Typically, it's not much longer than that. Okay. So let's talk about just the process overview, starting from when we, when we began. So for the buyer, it's really find the right business. It's really defined what, it's, what interests you, where your skills lie, because once you buy a business, uh, if you don't like it after 60 days, there's no money back guarantee. Um, and you can't just turn around and put it back on the market and sell it. That does not look good to the general audience. So you want to make sure that you measure twice and cut once. And, and finding the business, you should really think about the type of work that appeals to you and where your skill sets are and what type of life um, or uh, how that fits into your lifestyle. 
If you're a business owner, you want to find that right buyer. They may not be exactly like you. They may not have all of your skills and they may be intimidated about parts of your operation that to you seem, seem second nature, but that's going to be the, that's going to happen. You're not going to find the perfect buyer and a buyer is not going to find the perfect business. Once we connect the two, then there's basic due diligence. The seller needs to provide the, the few basic items that we talked about, three years of P&L, current year to date, real estate or lease info, basic employee information, um, and then any kind of customer concentrations or sales by product or category to give them a sense of where the revenue comes from. If after that due diligence, the buyer has, still has an interest, they make an offer, there's a, typically a back and forth negotiation. And once the basic terms of the deal are decided, that is memorialized in a letter of intent or a term sheet. From there, the buyer starts the process where they do they jump into full due diligence, go to banks if financing is required, start clearing things up in their personal life, maybe have, have to give notice, um, all of the things that they're doing, setting up a new company, so on and so forth. Um, that's number six that you show there. I mean, keep in mind that the buyer has a lot of responsibilities right now. They have to set up a new core, they have to apply for licensing, get a checking account, uh, so there's, there's a number of things that they're doing and they're often still working full time while they're doing it. And so this process can feel like it slows down. Uh, the seller may feel like the buyer has really slowed down the process now that the deal's made, but keep in mind if they are working full time and have family obligations, they're trying to do a lot of these things during lunch hours or a day off or night times and weekends. From there, the, the seller should start looking at clearing any liabilities on their assets so they can transfer them free and clear. And if there are third parties, whether it's leasing companies or landlords or licensing authorities, they need to be contacted. And sometimes that can be delicate because you don't want to risk breaching confidentiality, but you want to know and identify problems with third parties sooner rather than later. You don't want those, those occurring at the day of closing because they could kill the whole deal. Finally, once a definitive document, the purchase and sale is finalized between both attorneys, it can be executed. And often it's executed prior to the closing, sometimes days, weeks, or a month with a closing date picked in the future. And it's at the closing that all of the actual transference of finances and assets occur. And we have the closing and then post-closing, we have the items that we just talked about, training, um, escrowing amounts if needed, seller notes, those types of things. So that's the basic process. I like to think that looks pretty simple. Um, if you've never done it before, it probably seems um, like there's a lot of items there, but again, it's, it's, there is a methodical process that can be followed to allow both buyer and seller um, guidelines and also to avoid uh, any mistakes. And certainly one of the biggest ones is making sure that you have qualified uh, corporate counsel or an attorney um, providing the services, especially later in the, in the document drafting. So that's all I have. This again was an abbreviated version of a workshop that was normally three 